Hello from Heinz Chapel. We're going to be looking at our Sunday School lesson this morning for February the 7th. Uh, my name is Janice Carter and I'm one of the uh, folks here who helps teach from time to time. Uh, the name of our lesson today is called To Testify. Um, and as we think about the word testify, just a minute, um, a lot of times we use words and you know, um, all the time, and we know in our minds what they mean, but just to think about the definition of testify for a minute. Um, we hear it a lot of times in terms of a court, a hearing, or a court case, uh, and it's to make a declaration under oath uh, for the purpose of establishing the truth or establishing a fact. I think when we think about testify in biblical terms, um, it's more to express our personal conviction, what we believe, um, based on our knowledge or belief. And that's sort of what our lesson is going to be looking at today. Uh, the focus of our lesson is that we're going to be asking Jesus to reveal himself to our community through our witness, through our testifying to them. Um, and as we um, think about <clears throat> our communities, uh, whether you live in a small town or in a huge populated area, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> you still live within a community. <clears throat> now my voice is going to act up right now, so excuse me just a minute. Let's see if I can get this frog cleared out of my throat. <clears> throat> okay. So we know we either live in a small town, some of us live in large metropolitan areas, but we still live within a community. Um, you likely go to a grocery store within your community. Um, you probably shop for clothes and other things in your community. You probably buy gas for your car within your community. And you get to know uh, the people or recognize the people at these places and speak to them and a lot of times have conversation and uh, you know a little bit about each other. Um, as we look at people in our communities, there's one thing they all have in common. Uh, there are people in our communities that need Jesus. They need to know Jesus. As we look around us, we see people that are hurting um, over the loss, maybe of a loved one. Um, maybe they're in financial trouble. They're coping with health issues. We've had this virus now going on for a year and many people have been um, afflicted with it. They've taken it. They've lost their lives. Um, and it's created a lot of fear in people's lives. So um, there, there is a need in our communities for people to really uh, come to know Jesus. They need him. Believe me, they really do. Uh, so there is a need here for us to share Jesus to those around us, those in our communities. Um, our lesson today comes from uh, the fourth chapter of uh, John. And just a little bit of background, it's about Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well, which is a story you probably have studied uh, if you've been in Sunday school or church through the years, you've heard it. But um, in Jesus' day, the Holy Land had three uh, major areas or provinces. There was Galilee in the north, uh, Samaria was in the central mountain or highland area, and Judea was to the south. Um, many Jews would not enter Samaria because they believed that they would be defiled if they had any contact with the Samaritans. So you wonder, well, why would this be? Well, the Samaritans were considered a, a mixed breed. Um, they were half Jew and half Gentile. We go back to when Assyria captured the northern kingdom of Israel in 721 BC. Some of the Jews were taken into captivity, but some of the Jews were left behind. And those that were left behind intermarried with the Assyrians. And these people were neither fully Jew nor were they fully Gentile. Um, they did have their own copy of the first five books um, of Scripture. Uh, they had a system of worship. They even had their own temple on Mount, I think it's Gerizim. I think I'm maybe hopefully 
pronouncing that correctly. But they didn't go to the temple in Jerusalem. They went to their own temple to worship. They also, they worshipped God, but they also worshipped other deities. So um, at the time of um, Jesus, the Samaritans um, and Jews, they did not deal with each other. The Jews uh, particularly felt like if they came in contact with a Samaritan that they had been defiled, they were unclean. Um, the mutual hatred between these two people, as, as you can see, goes back uh, hundreds of years before Jesus. Um, and out of these uh, mixed marriages came this religion that mixed the worship of Yahweh, God, and that of other pagan gods. Uh, when the Jews later returned to Jerusalem from Babylon, uh, from Babylonian captivity, uh, they encountered the Samaritans and uh, they were hostile to them and their uh, religion. And uh, the hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans continued for centuries. The Jews that lived north of Samaria, they often traveled many miles out of their way to avoid going through Samaria on their way to Jerusalem. Uh, and also to be called a Samaritan was the worst form of an insult. So uh, as we see, there was a lot of animosity there, a lot of hatred, a lot of prejudice. Um, our scripture today uh, begins at verse 25 of John 4. But I want to go back and read uh, verses 3 through 24 um, to give you some background of what is taken prior to Jesus' encounter uh, with this woman uh, at the well. If you've got your Bibles um, and want to follow along, uh, we're going to start with uh, verse 3. It says, He left Judea, and that's talking about Jesus left Judea, and departed again into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. And we think that probably was around noontime. It says, There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman therefore said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob. Are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know. We worship that which we know for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. 
God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Okay, this is where um, that our scripture today uh, takes up after that. But as we think about these verses, uh, just a minute, Jesus' meeting uh, with the woman from Samaria at Jacob's well would have raised eyebrows in the Jewish culture at that time. First, no respectable rabbi ever conversed with a woman in public. Second, no rabbi would ever have allowed himself to associate with a Samaritan, especially um, because of that hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans being so intense. And third, no rabbi would have consciously allowed himself to be anywhere near a woman of questionable morals. I mean, Jesus had taught with her. He knew that she had five husbands and that the man she was with at, at the time was not her husband. But Jesus broke all these taboos. He also chose to tell this woman that he was the promised Messiah. For instance, through the metaphor of water, Jesus assured the woman that she could quench her inner thirst by trusting in him for eternal life. Okay, um, her lesson scripture picks up here. So let's look at verses 25 through 30. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Upon hearing the truths Jesus spoke, the Samaritan woman started to wonder if he was more than just a prophet. The woman voiced the hope of both the Samaritans and the Jews, namely that the Messiah would come. At this point, Jesus directly told the Samaritan woman that he was the Messiah. And um, she had, had told him that she knew about the Messiah, and she knew this because they had the first uh, five books of Scripture. Um, and she said the Messiah was called Christ. Christ is a word borrowed from Greek and means anointed one. The Hebrew word for anointed one is translated Messiah. It was used for the promised one who would deliver the people of Israel from their oppression. And we know that the Jews hoped for a Messiah to deliver them and their nation was Primarily, they were thinking in political terms. They were thinking of a king, someone who was going to come and conquer. Consequently, most of Jesus' contemporaries failed to recognize him as the true Messiah of Israel. But then, just then, the disciples returned with some food. If you'll remember, they had gone into town to get food for, for Jesus. Um, and because of the culture at that time and the prejudice against women, they were astonished or astounded to discover the Savior here speaking in public to a woman and much less a Samaritan woman. Yet his disciples had been with him long enough to know not to question uh, their master, who by his actions was teaching them to break down the walls of prejudice, to break down those walls of hatred. Meanwhile, the woman abandoned her jug of water at the well and hurried back to the village. Her excited response showed the impression that Jesus had made on her. She seemed thrilled that Jesus was able to tell her everything she ever did. And he didn't tell her everything, but the things he told her were significant. It was enough that she knew this man was different. 
and still talk with her and accept her. The woman did not say to her peers when she went back, I have found the Redeemer, Redeemer, but she asked them humbly, could this be the Messiah? The woman's indirect approach aroused the interest of the Samaritans. By simply relating what had happened to her, the woman generated considerable interest and a large number of residents from Sychar responded to the woman's invitation. Okay, um, because the Samaritans knew and had faith in the first five books of the Bible, they were expecting the Messiah to come someday. So based on their faith in the scriptures and the woman's testimony about what Jesus had done, they left the city and they were going to go and meet this man too. They came to see Jesus. So sometimes I think the best thing we can do is to invite people to come and learn about Jesus because some will take us up on that invitation and then they will come to believe uh, what they are taught from the Bible. Um, she just gave, she just told them, could this be the Messiah? And it perked their interest enough that they wanted to go and meet this man. They wanted to go and see him themselves. Okay, let's look at verses 31 through 38 and see what happened. You'll remember the disciples had come back with the, some food. It says, Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, It's still four months till harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. When the disciples returned with food they had bought, they kept urging Jesus to eat. Previously, they had left him weary and hungry. But Jesus declined their offer by stating that he had food to eat that they were not familiar with, that they didn't know about. Because his disciples took him literally, rather than figuratively, they misunderstood what he meant. They thought, well, maybe somebody brought him something to eat while we were gone. But Jesus explained that his nourishment came from doing the will of the one who sent him and accomplishing the task that he had been sent to do. Um, as we think about this, uh, Jesus declared to his disciples that his food or bread was to do the will of his Father and to complete the work that he had been sent to do. And in Matthew 1, 21, verse 21, we learn that the Father's will for Jesus was for him to come into the world and to save his people from their sins. Through uh, the salvation was from the Jews, and we know Jesus was a Jew, the Samaritans were included among those Jesus came to save. Jesus had a whole city of Samaritans coming toward him. And more than eating physical food at that time, Jesus wanted to complete the work of God in the life of each of those Samaritans who would receive him as their Savior. Um, so we see here... Um, the Savior um, urged his followers to look and see that the fields for evangelism were ripe and ready to yield an abundant crop of believers. Both those who seed, uh, who sowed the seed of gospel and those who reaped the harvest of many converts were overjoyed so that many were brought to eternal life. 
In fact, if we stop and think about it, others such as John the Baptist had planted the seeds and sown the crops before Jesus' disciples. Now they could reap the benefits of the work of others. In response, um, we see here in Jesus' response to his disciples, he referred to the familiar practice of harvesting crops from seeds that farmers planted. In ancient times, the farmer would first break up the hard soil by using a wooden plow or some type of instrument and oxen or animals. And then additional workers would follow behind carrying that seed in a jar or pa uh, basket or something and uh, they would drop those handfuls of seed and scatter them on the ground. Um, but Jesus wanted the disciples to see the crowd coming toward him as a spiritual field that was ripe for harvesting, for spiritual harvesting. Um, Jesus had met um, at the well. Those coming to see him were ripe for harvesting once they came to know him. Jesus wanted to do his Father's will and make himself known to them so they could repent of their sins, believe in him, and receive that gift of eternal life. Um, <clears throat> Jesus had sowed words of truth when he spoke to the woman, um, and his words took deep root in her, and she believed in him. Now she had sown a few words of truth into the minds of her neighbors, and they were coming to see Jesus. After they heard more words of truth from Jesus that Jesus sowed into their hearts and minds, they came to trust Jesus too. Um, and I think as Christians, um, if we think about this, we can also remember or recollect times in our lives when someone planted some seeds uh, of truth into our lives before we fully accepted Christ as our Savior. Maybe it was our parents, a loving father or mother, a Sunday school teacher, uh, a preacher, a friend, or maybe even a stranger. Uh, then perhaps someone else at a later time in our life harvested those seeds that had been sown and helped us fully confess and believe in Jesus Christ and put our faith in him as our personal Lord and Savior. Sometimes it's a process. Those seeds are planted and it might take years uh, for the harvest to be, uh, be reaped. <clears throat> just, as the, just as the disciples reap the results of the words of God um, sown through the seeds of Moses, the prophets, uh, the Hebrew scriptures, John the Baptist, even Jesus, they harvested those they met who had heard these words and repented of their sins and believed in Jesus and then received him uh, as that gift of eternal life. So we see the disciples, um, they did a lot of reaping of those seeds that were sown earlier by Moses by the prophets, by the Hebrews, the scriptures, John the Baptist, Jesus. Granted, they planted seeds too that probably were reaped later on by other people, but they did a lot of reaping of seeds that had been planted earlier in the lives of people. We enter into the work of others who have worked before us when we teach someone about the Bible. Many work have worked to preserve the scriptures over hundreds of years. And from one generation to another, many have worked to teach that the Bible is true. And that's what we want to continue to do, what we need to do in our communities. Go out and share this word. Continue to teach the truth of Jesus Christ. So we look at... Um, <clears throat> The remaining scriptures here, verses 39 through 42, it says, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. 
and because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. The residents of Sychar were amazed that Jesus had had such incredible insight into the personal life of this woman that they knew. They knew her life. They knew her history. As a result of her testimony, many Samaritans put their faith in Jesus as the Messiah. The villagers were even more impressed with Jesus when they met him face to face. They urged him, pleaded with him to remain with them, and Jesus stayed for two days, teaching and sharing the word with them. This personal encounter with Jesus became the basis for the Samaritans declaring him to be far more than a prophet. Amazingly, they called him the Savior of the world. The response of the Samaritans to the presence of Jesus contrasts with that of the Jews that he had come to reach. If you'll remember, the Jews he had been speaking to, uh, teaching to at this time, many of them became jealous of him. Um, they were looking for uh, a conqueror to come. They questioned Jesus, um, and we know that eventually many of them turned against him. The Samaritans not only believed that Jesus is the Messiah, but they openly declared this uh, to others. <clears throat> After the Samaritans came um, to believe Jesus, they wanted to know him better. The Bible reveals the simple fact that those who truly receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior will want to learn more and more about him so they can love him and serve him better and become better prepared to help others believe in him also. Millions have come to believe in Jesus because of Jesus' words and actions as they have studied the Gospel of John. These Christians are the harvest of the seeds that John sowed when he wrote his book almost 2,000 years ago. We learn of Jesus and come to believe in Jesus from reading or hearing words from the Bible, or from others telling us, uh, teaching us about him. We believe in Jesus and come to know him because he makes himself known to us spiritually by the Holy Spirit, who helps us grow in knowledge of him from the Bible. Jesus spent two days teaching these new believers in Sychar how to know him and talk to uh, him in his absence, how to pray to him. Jesus also showed his disciples what and how to teach new believers after they came to faith in him. After these Samaritans learned more about Jesus from him, just as believers today learn more about Jesus from the Bible, as the Holy Spirit helps us understand the Word of God, these Samaritans came to know that Jesus is truly the Savior of the world. As believers in Jesus pray and study the Bible, with the help of the Holy Spirit, they can move, we can move beyond simply believing the truth about uh, Jesus to knowing Jesus, to knowing that he truly is the Savior of the world, that he is our Savior, and to teach others how to believe in and know Jesus too. <clears throat> you know, it's one thing to know Jesus, to know who he is, uh, to know um, the scriptures, but it's another thing to really know him in your heart, uh, to have that oneness with him. Uh, it's just, there's nothing like knowing him as your Lord and Savior, the peace that it gives, um, because we know that he's sovereign, he is in control, and uh, there's no greater peace than knowing, really knowing that he is your Lord and Savior. 
as we look at um, this lesson and sharing, um, being a witness, a, a testament, or testify to those in our community, God wants us to be on the alert to share our faith in Christ with those people who were lost and without Him. And they're all around us. All we have to do is look and see. God does not call us all to serve Him in the exact same way. There are those who plant, as we saw in our lesson today, and those who sow, and those who harvest, all in their own individual way. But we need to be obedient to um, his call to serve him with the spiritual gift that he has given us. As we think about telling others about Jesus, um, I think we need to keep our minds focused on him and what it is we are trying to accomplish. And our book here had a, a good little story or a, a thought in it that I thought was good at the end. It says, when we look at our garden, do we spend more time focusing on the flower or on the weeds. For many of us, our daily struggles with the weeds often take away our enjoyment of the beauty of the flowers. So too it is with the people in our community. Sometimes we are so intent on being critical of what's wrong with our society that we forget that the opportunities to share the gospel with those who are lost are all around us, and truly, those opportunities should excite us. In today's lesson, there was a woman by a well who met Jesus. She was surprised that he spoke to her, since men at that time usually didn't speak to women, any women, and especially a Samaritan woman. She was even more shocked to realize he was the Messiah after he was able to tell her about her life and some of the things that she had done and in her life. She then went home and simply told people what she had experienced. She didn't need a college education to do it. She didn't need an evangelistic course. She didn't need to practice her testimony. She simply shared what had happened to her. God used her, and many townspeople saw and believed in Jesus because of her. He can do the same with us if we just share what has happened in our lives, what Jesus means to us, what he's done for us. We can be used to share Jesus in our communities, uh, in our home, with our family in our workplace, with our neighbors, with our friends, even in our church. So I think as we, we look at this lesson, it's just a, a good uh, reminder of the urgency that we have to tell those who are lost about Jesus. Those non-Christians, those people that don't know him, need to know him. As we look around us, we see people everywhere who need to know the Lord. Um, this was a good lesson, I thought. Um, as we see so much that's wrong with our society, so much that's wrong around, around us, help us look for those opportunities, Lord, to share you, to share you with people who need to know you. Let's uh, close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just uh, thank you for your word. Thank you for... Uh, being our Lord and Savior, our Messiah. Lord, help us be like this woman at the well and just be so excited that we don't tarry, but we run to share you with others, Lord. It's the greatest gift that we can give someone, Lord, is to come to know you. We just uh, thank you for your love and your care, and we just ask you to be with us and uh, we know that you give us the Holy Spirit to, to help us as we go out to witness for you. And we just uh, ask you, Lord, to trust, ask us, Lord, to trust you to do that. We love you and we want to be that witness to a lost world. We just thank you now for this day. We thank you for the privilege, Lord, 
of uh, studying your word, of being able to share it with others. We just uh, thank you, and we love you, and we praise your name. We just ask all these things in your precious Son's name. Amen. Thank you, and hope you can join us again next week. Our lesson next week comes from um, the Gospels, and um, we'll be looking at um, more incidences of where the testimony of a person is so important. So uh, have a good day and a good week. Thank <laughs> you.